Good evening, my name is Alan Gosser. We're here in Michael Arnowitz's West End Toronto home to talk about a new piano program that he's performing this Saturday night uh, at, Lon, uh, at Grace Church on the Hill, Lonsdale Road, north of St. Clair near, uh, near Spadina. The title of it, after all of that detail, the title of it <laughs> yeah. is Kaleidoscope. And that's, uh, that's where I wanted to begin, if I could, uh, to ask you um, what sort of things you want to suggest with that beautiful title and image of a kaleidoscopic uh, pattern. Yeah, I, always, I, I think I always was fascinated with kaleidoscopes from my, you know, back in the days when I was a little kid, right? And uh, all you have to do is just uh, rotate it <laughs> with your hand and you get these marvelous different color patterns and uh, kind of stimulates the imagination I think a kaleidoscope so I tried to uh, I thought it was a nice title for my program which has a ton of these uh, very colorful and uh, imaginative and evocative pieces so I, I know it stimulates my imagination and I certainly hope the audience will, uh, will get in the groove as well. I wonder if you've <clears> been uh, performing it as you go along in different places, do you rotate the kaleidoscope so that those little pieces <laughs> fall into different patterns, or do you do you prefer sticking to the same pattern every night? Well, it is it is true. The wonderful thing about live concert performances, which I hope will never die, is that uh, they are different from night to night, and uh, and also sometimes a piece on the program might. Uh, influence another piece on the program you know if you play a piece in a certain way it might set up a progression of moods and therefore when you get to that same piece on the program that you played you know on your previous <laughs> concert a couple of days before it might feel differently to you the, the pieces do yeah. connect and uh, that's another aspect of uh, what I think people will pick up when they listen to this concert um, is some of the connections between the, the different composers music on the program. <clears throat> I'm interested to know uh, when I think of you I, and I've known about your piano playing for a long time I think of you as a as a kind of a 21st century Franz Liszt who encompasses huge big amazing things as well as small little things and um and yet you're not really all about the big piano pieces that are long and romantic from the 19th century and the closest you come on this program is somebody who started to break the mold of that with Debussy uh, can you describe what you what you get out of those uh, Debussy pieces? They're not big and grand necessarily. Well, he wrote them at the very end of his life and playing two of his etudes, which he, yeah, this is just a couple years before he died. And, and they are really <laughs> imaginative pieces and they have uh, some of the words that he, he uh, these French words that he writes really sent me to the... Uh, the old dictionary which is right <laughs> behind me actually <laughs> on the bookshelf and uh because there was there was one word that uh it translated to mean babbling <laughs> it was like balabile in french balabille. and i never 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 learned that word in french class <laughs> um but it turned out to mean babbling another word meant volleyball so i i kind of think that the one of the nice aspects of the piece is that uh, although they have these great inventions in harmony and sonority of the piano and and you know the, the water imagery and all the beautiful things you think of with French Impressionist music, but but Debussy was also a people person. And you know he, I, I bought this book of his letters, which I just love. His letters are so entertaining, and uh, yeah, I think he, you know, maybe he knew somebody who was sort of had that babbling personality or that <laughs> voluble. You know, we all know people like that, right? So this is. Uh, a way you know anybody can relate to his music is think of the the, the personal aspects of it i think mm -hmm. so you've also made a habit of being connected to living composers 
throughout your life. Mm -hmm. And I know that you have something really special to introduce to us, which is music from a Ukrainian person. So when they collect your letters, what are they going to find out about how did you get in touch with this Ukrainian person? And could you tell us a little bit about her and her music? Yeah, I discovered her music um, online. Um, most of her music doesn't seem to be published, at least the piano. We should piece. say her name, Victoria. Yes. Yeah, Polova. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's uh, about about my age, actually. And um, so she's quite well known in Europe. And, and sort of I've decided to take on a, a little campaign or whatever the right word is um, that I'm going to advocate for her music in our part of the world, meaning uh, Canada and the United States. So I've been she yeah it was a little difficult to track down her music since it's not published and the language barrier but um yeah just two weeks before russia invaded ukraine she uh suddenly uh did send me a whole pile of her piano music uh, through the computer so about 12 pieces and um i am uh blind so i have the special technology that i need to use to learn music so i got the music inputted into this uh, uh, computer software that helps me um, by speaking out loud the, the notes and information about a musical score. And uh, so we gradually inputted some of the pieces that she, the uh, printed music pieces that she sent me. And I've selected four to perform on this program uh, that I, I think are a good introduction to her musical personality. I have a a fifth one that I'm saving in store for uh, some more concerts later. Um, but the, the four that I'm going to play, um, uh, the first one is actually the most recent one. It's an excerpt from her uh, 2021 ballet. <clears throat> so it just came out last year. And that's kind of a good, ex it's, it's kind of a piano prelude. Um, there's like a little orchestra, I think, but um, it does start with the piano by itself. So I thought I would use that as my first piece in my little set of pieces by her and uh and it's very um uh, spiritual and absorbing uh, it's absorbing is just a, a word i find myself using a lot in recent years but it it's it's a high compliment and um the second piece uh the second and third pieces are from a set she, he, she wrote called marginalia uh, i think Correct me if I'm wrong, Alan, but isn't marginalia like little comments that you would write? In yeah, I think if you're uh, and... reading a famous book, the marginalia <clears throat> are the notes that you make as you're as you're reading to to explain, like, wow, what was that all about? Or or uh, yeah, see also. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if there's any like <clears throat> like it refers to commentary in religious books too, but I'm not mm -hmm. totally sure. But regardless, um, maybe these are little comments on our life i don't know but the first one i'm going to play is called music that is not yet and she has actually a lot of titles that reflect her uh, philosophical belief that music comes from the void uh, silence or nothingness and actually returns to it as well so that's kind of an interesting you were citing yeah. a, an interview of hers in fact where um, she, uh, I can't remember the details, something about her hearing music coming out of that void and wondering why her parents were so resistant to her talking about it. Yeah, she tells this childhood story. I think she was like, she said even when she was like four or five years old, when she, at night, when she went to bed and she put her head on the pillow, it would like start up all this music <laughs> inside her. And like when she raised her head from the pillow, the music would stop. Put the head back down on the pillow. Wow. She said it was like a tape recorder that you were pressing on and off. Mm -hmm. And when she told her parents about it, uh, yeah, no, uh, no understanding at all from her parents. <laughs> so she uh, thought that was learned uh, how to not talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so she's kind of developed her her personal world of of the things that gave her uh, pleasure and interest during her childhood and. No, but uh, fortunately for us, she wrote this wonderful music. So music that is not yet is kind of a tender piece. She does, uh, even though the first piece is, is a rather kind of pure musical piece, 
the second piece she does throw in the moto espressivo <laughs> comment uh one thing that she seems to definitely put in her in her scores um and then from the same set i'm playing uh, lacrimosa which is a uh kind of evokes the sound of a cathedral to me with the kind of blurring echoes right of a, of a cathedral and it's sort of a cryptic piece it's actually written in, in this sort of a graphic notation you know what i mean by that mm -hmm. so instead of having like definite bar lines and exact uh, you know rhythm specifications that sort of spaced out on the page and you visually look at it and decide how to play it that's interesting <laughs> so yeah. um, quite apart from the language barriers of you listening to an interview by a ukrainian who doesn't speak english doesn't seem okay. like she does uh, she so how did you do that first of all how did you listen to a, a an interview with her oh those were translated yeah mm -hmm. online so they have uh yeah they, they have somebody sense. there so how do you translate between a uh, a sighted ukrainian composer and a non-sighted english-speaking performer when you're trying to see these things and visualize what you need to do uh are you able to ask her any questions or do you just <laughs> guess when it comes to comes down to it um well, the, the person that helps me to input it all into the computer, I guess he made a few judgment calls. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I asked some questions also. Um, but I, anyway, the way I've decided to play the piece is to kind of blur the, the different notes together with a, with a, uh, with the pedal of the piano to create that kind of cathedral effect and um anyway it, it is a, a super interesting piece and then i'm going to complete my set of her music with uh, a big canvas piece that's sort of her intense dramatic side which she also has and i think some of her best pieces are these kind of string orchestra pieces and choral pieces that are just really really knock your socks off um and this is an example of that in a, in a piano piece, and it's called Sonata Number Two, Quasi Una Fantasia, which might be a familiar title to pianists or piano students out there, because actually Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata is technically he. That's the real title. <laughs> yeah, he didn't call it Moonlight Sonata, and, or and that's he the hated that title. I guess but. that's not the title <laughs> so much as the uh, performance uh, instruction. That is, it is a sonata, but also a fantasy. As if it were a fantasy, yeah. And this is a, just like I say, it's a big canvas piece with a, with a quite a expressive and, and personal aspect to it. There's, uh, there's some very interesting combinations of minor and major at the same time that, both in the harmony and the melody, and and also some just very interesting cinematographic if that's the right word um the changes of scenes are sometimes blurred also i remember i mm. just mentioned about how the the cathedral sound in the lacrimosa well this also shows sometimes like underlay this major stuff i'm playing sort of in the medium and the higher parts of the piano with this low minor chord <laughs> and just let it let that minor chord hang out and it's really interesting um, the combination of the of the coloristic textures of a minor and a major sound and putting it together so she does a lot of stuff like that in this piece that I I find uh, super interesting and I hope, I hope people will too I've started to play this music in America and a couple of, I did uh, three concerts there quite recently leading up to this Toronto concert and people definitely did like the music and did respond to it and and one one audience person said it was very soulful music to her so hope that's... you described one of her pieces as somehow reminding you or evoking um the spirit or the manner of bach of course uh, she's writing in a you know 
deliberately for a piano. If she chooses piano, she means piano. And Bach <laughs> wrote for something that we have no idea of. How do you uh, how do you connect those, like a, a completely living person, um, who's writing for the piano, which has such an amazing history, with Bach, who, whom you've played forever and a day, and uh, and well, actually, everybody well, knows yeah. a lot of Bach, right? Yeah, well, the, the piece that it reminded me of was Bach's Chacon for solo violin, which is the final movement of one of his solo violin pieces, and it's a big, intense and sober piece. But but it, it, it was just maybe some of the, the harmonies and textures at the beginning of the piece and the, uh, the bass line movement that reminded me of it. Um, she, she doesn't, in her interviews, mention some of her composers that have influenced her you know of course she does mention Bach, Mozart, Beethoven but also some others that aren't as in the uh, pantheon there but um, yeah uh, you know well, Bach is probably the greatest composer in my book so it, I, maybe I see Bach everywhere but but uh, yeah there's a certain texture that Bach has has with you know three-part counterpoint that uh, I'm actually playing on this program some of his sinfonias which are for three-part counterpoint and they're wonderful pieces as well so maybe people after getting primed at the beginning of the concert with this little set I'm doing of Bach three-part sinfonias maybe they'll also hear that little connection to that that very wonderful final piece I'm going to play of, of Victoria Polova mm-hmm you also described that um, there's some amazing technical and expressive effects in the oddly titled pieces of George <laughs> Benjamin. One of them is called Hammers. <laughs> yeah, Hammers. And, I love know, this. One of them is, uh, is also called Mosaic, which is almost as uh, evocative as Kaleidoscope when you, when you yeah, think of it some ways, right? Could have called the program Mosaic, maybe. <laughs> It's also colorful. <laughs> um, yeah, well, one of the things I like about George Benjamin, who's a, a UK composer, um, I think he wrote this music in the early 2000s, right? And um, 2004, I believe. Mm -hmm. And he, he sometimes restricts himself. I think one thing that great composers will do, so sometimes restrict themselves to a, uh, a narrow palette, right? Um, to use our color <laughs> analogy, I guess like right, Picasso's blue period or his rose period, right? And it's uh, interesting when they do restrict their vocabulary, but they develop within it. And um, so he sometimes is very careful about using only one part of the piano. So um, the piece uh, spell, like a magic spell, not <laughs> spelling bee, um, is like almost all above middle C, so only using the upper half of the piano, whereas Hmm. There's a piece called Alone, which as you can imagine is a rather brooding little number. And that piece um, only uses the, the bottom half of the piano. Whereas Mosaic, you want to take a guess? <laughs> it's all over, right? It uses everything. <laughs> and these little sort of filigree, you know. <laughs> you know and yeah. uh, just um, my hands have to delicately play these little uh, fine uh, phrases that, that do cover the... Uh, all over the piano and um, and there's also this sort of mosaic aspect that that I guess little things every time I play this certain melody note you hear this little filigree pattern that is always connected to that note so if I ever come back to that note you always hear that same phrase that same little light phrase um, so maybe that's like you know you're seeing the same you know, color green emerging Little snapshots that are shuffled like cards or different, something. Well, I think of the mosaic, you know, mm -hmm. like when you see an actual mosaic, right? You see these repetitions mm -hmm. of the color patterns. Um, but yes, my, I think the most unusual piece of the five of his that I'm playing is called Hammers. And it, it is this most realistic evocation of, uh, of actually, you know, hammering nails and what does that sound like and what is the, process like because he will sometimes uh he'll sometimes 
change the speed of the beats of the beats in between the hammer strokes so sometimes they're they're three beats apart sometimes they're four beats apart sometimes they're five beats apart sometimes they're six beats apart and i think this sort of reflects you know i think of it like the the carpenter's thinking you know Hmm, you know, bam, bam, bam. Hmm, think about that. Okay, over here. Bam, 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 bam. <laughs> and you, you kind of hear the the speeding up or the slowing down mm -hmm. of the, the thought process maybe of the work work person. Yeah, I like it's just a kind of a bright, brilliant and creative piece. So that's uh, what that's about. I'm also interested in in uh, those ligety pieces that you're uh programming and uh, some of them have uh, titles that are more straightforward, uh, like Rainbow and Sorcerer's Apprentice and Fanfares. Yeah. But the one that's called Open Strings, what does that refer to the piano uh, imitating a uh, cello or something? What? How can you call yeah, that? Yeah, good, good guess there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, violins and violas and cellos are tuned in this. Uh distance between two notes musicians we call the, the perfect fifth and that's the sound you hear when you hear them tuning up their instrument and he takes this bomb bomb you know that distance yeah. and he chains together long 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 strands so it's like this tremendously long uh, piece of yarn that's of a certain color I think of it as um, and it's like he's weaving these different long strands together and these you know sometimes they're like nine nine notes long so it's kind of draping these these things all over the piano um, and they're entering and they're fading in and out and it's just this beautiful tapestry of sounds probably my favorite of his these etudes which he wrote and yeah I'll be playing four of them on the concert uh -huh. uh, Saturday night now one of the things uh, oh yeah we'll just say again w this is all headed towards a concert Saturday night October 1st 7.30 at Grace Church on the Hill, uh, just north of St. Clair on Lonsdale Road. Um, right. Uh, I yeah. wanted to ask, uh, with all this music that's come into your head and come out of your fingertips, yeah. um, how does it get processed when you do something of your own, like writing a jazz influenced <laughs> yeah, version <laughs> of Carmina Burana, which yeah. you call Burana Bop? Yeah. How does I, that happen? <laughs> well, I I listen, of course, to the original piece, which is by Carl Orff, very familiar, striking and dramatic things, and somehow I I try to bring it in, transform the original musical material into the world of jazz. So, one idea I had was um, there's a, a moment in, and I'll see if I can try to sing it. Uh, Da 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 dum ba da dum bum 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 ba da dum ba 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 ba. Okay, so mm -hmm. so I came up with this idea that of sort of freezing the music. So I would go ba da 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 bum. I get to that note, the melody, freeze it with a jazz chord, like right on that note, mm -hmm. and then sort of you know like the percussion is kind of bubbling along as the chord is just held, and then and then I go. Da 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 ba. Stop on that note too. So I don't open know. it up and uh... maybe it's like that. Maybe I was thinking of that Simon Says game or whatever. Or what's <laughs> you can't the game? move any further. Yeah. What's a childhood game where you where the person can make you stop in the middle and freeze? But Simon says go. <laughs> Simon says stop. Yes. Yeah. So Very I, nice. So I thought of that as a little concept. Another thing I did was. Uh, breaks so uh, the jazz idea is uh, that you you have a drum that's going for a while but then the drum sort of goes stops and then the soloist plays completely by themselves for a little mm -hmm. while so yeah I took the opening measures and I and, he, and I, I also play them in a very super dramatic way of you know the opening of Carmina Burana but but then I sort of switch gears and now I bring in you know a swing jazz aesthetic and now I'm you know go the da bop and I do a break but da da yeah improvise a little bit for a few measures go back to the beat 
so I do, I think Dave Brubeck did something somewhat similar to that in the Blue Rondo a la Turk. So, but I, I did, I do it in a different way, but it's the same kind of idea of switching gears. And so yeah, I've, I've created this whole, uh, again, kind of large canvas thing of taking different ideas from Carmina Burana and bringing it, uh, transforming it into the language of jazz and improvisation. I'm interested by the way you talk about music and uh, I wonder, I have a question that I'm saving for you, but is there anything about any of the particular pieces that we haven't covered that you think you, you that we should uh, prepare your listeners for, for Saturday night's concert? Oh, I don't know. We could, um, I got an interesting comment from a audience member, actually one of my mm -hmm. concerts, would you like to hear it? I was... He came up to me at intermission and he said that I played music in a conversational manner, conversational way, which nobody had ever said to me before, but maybe it's so. Maybe I think of the different textures that make up the, you know, the individual parts and the, of course, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, right? That's, right. You know, I know you, you uh, do choral directing so you know all about the, just the, that, the yeah. high of the high of you know when you have the alto and the soprano and the tenor and the bass and they you know all the sections come and together. they're making a good conversation yeah 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 well uh, that that's a little bit related to the question that's forming in my mind let's hope it forms really well which is uh how we met was uh, okay. you were coming up to uh, to Toronto to dig around in the archives of the CBC to find stuff about Glenn Gould, um, who was of course uh, such a monstrously romantic figure, and he loved to talk and to write about music in very peculiar ways. Um, and I heard, and I remind you, of as we were talking, <laughs> a, a couple okay. phrases that you said reminded me of uh, little weird things that he would say because he was not afraid to take himself super seriously, even when he was saying the most sort of outlandish things. Um, and I wonder uh, what you remember from all those years ago when we met. <laughs> What did you find in the uh, in the CBC archives, and how did it how did it change your life, or how did it uh, transform your understanding of Glenn Gould? Just for well, a I random question. I, okay, like, that is a random question. I, <laughs> I think I was actually looking for a specific thing that he talked about, loving this Richard Strauss piece called Metamorphose, which is for twenty three solo strings. Right, it's a beautiful string orchestra piece, and uh, that you know he played this stuff on the piano late night. I, you know, having moved to Toronto, I, everybody seems to have a Glenn Gould story. Everybody seems to have, you know, lived in the apartment below him or whatever, which is impossible, but <laughs> everybody does have their stories. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, he did a lot of late night Strauss and Wagner playing apparently. So I wondered if he had written it out and turned out he'd only written maybe like, you know, 10 or 11 pages of this, you know, it's pretty long. 25 minute long piece or so. So I ended up making my own piano transcription of it, but I was curious about his own. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, like many people, I'm fascinated by the guy and, you know, that he was a hermit in many respects, but you know, lived in the middle of Toronto, actually. I think, yeah, not on, far I think at from, one point he lived on St. Clair, right? Yeah, he there. lived on St. Clair, not not really all that far from Lonsdale Road where you're going to be performing <laughs> at Grace Church on the Hill. And maybe oh, that's there's a, your segue to <laughs> wrap segue us up. to <laughs> get out of our little uh, lacuna that I backed us into. It's a pleasure <laughs> talking to you, and Thanks, uh, I'm sure it'll be Likewise, yeah. great listening to the music, and I invite people to make themselves welcome. Just come on out to the church. They have a very fine piano and a wonderful yeah, place to sit and listen. They have a Steinway concert grand there. That's supposed to be quite a dynamic piano. So I'm looking forward to laying my fingers on it. And um, yeah, if anybody wants to uh, get more information about it, I think uh, on our YouTube video, there'll be a link. You can travel there. But um, otherwise, just come to the concert. It's on 
Saturday night at 7.30, October 1st, and uh, we have some special price deals for uh, students and people with disabilities at half price and anybody who's a, a refugee. I mean, I'm, of course, thinking about Ukraine with the music by the Ukrainian composer, but, but really any refugee will, will have a free admission for them. So. Uh, please welcome to Canada and welcome to uh, Canada. I like it. Yeah, and uh, welcome to some some making of music and uh, look forward to to uh, sharing the music with everybody in the audience. And uh, thank you again, Alan, for shepherding our conversation here. Thank you, Michael, and good evening.